Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, we're gonna talk in English because this, uh, this is uh, recorded and it will be available later on uh, on YouTube. So to introduce myself, I am Ivan, one of the Android uh, team leaders, and I'll be talking to you about a simple 2D game with a physics engine that we've developed. So let's go. What is the game about? Uh, it's a very simple game. Uh, uh, basically, the, there's balls that are falling from from the sky or the top of the screen, and you have a basket. Uh, a bucket actually, uh, on the bottom of the screen that you can fly uh, from left to right and the, the idea is uh, within a time limit to cut, catch as much uh, balls as you can in, in that bucket. So what do we need to implement this game? First of all we need a way to generate objects, uh, in this case balls that will appear from the top and fall down. Uh, we need a simple implementation of a physics engine that will uh, apply the gravity and calculate the collisions and we, we need to implement uh, the scoring and the time limit. So let's start with, with spawning those objects. Uh, so basically each object uh, in the game is either a circle or a rectangle. Uh, later I'll explain where do uh, rectangles come into place. Um, it has a number of uh, properties. Uh, it has a flag which notifies if the gravity is applied to that object or not. Uh, it has its current position on the screen, uh, the x and y uh, coordinates, it has it, and it has its current uh, speed in the x and in the y uh, direction. The speed is measured in uh, pixels per second. And, okay, let's, let's see how, how they're uh, spawned. Uh, basically, we have a spawning area above the screen uh, that isn't visible. And within a time interval, each I don't know, second or two, uh, we generate a new uh, object, a new circle which represents a ball. And uh, once we generate it, we add it to the physics engine, which immediately starts applying the gravity to it and calculating the collisions. Uh, once the object objects fall down uh, inside the bucket or go out of the screen, they're immediately destroyed to preserve uh, the memory. Uh, of course, the objects are, uh, the balls are of uh, random size, uh, I mean random white, and they have uh, numbers from 0 to 9, which represent the score that you get for, for catching each one of them. So, let's talk about the collisions and how, how they're detected and handled. Uh, detection first. Uh, so, the sim simplest way to uh, detect collisions is to have the rectangle bounding boxes uh, around your objects, and uh, in, in this case, uh, when two of the rectangles around the objects are uh, in, are intersecting, or in extreme case, if one is uh, contained in another, you have a collision. So basically, this this way you can uh, in a fast and easy way detect uh, collisions. There's two other ways. Uh, you can, for circles, you can check uh, the distance between the radius of circles and check if they're uh, smaller or equal to the sum uh, of their uh, sum of their radiuses. Uh, another special case is when you have a rectangle and a circle. Uh, in that case you have to take the point that's closest, point in the rectangle that's closest to the circle and the center of the circle and check their distance. Uh, what we do in the first step on each frame is we uh, check the bounding boxes for each of the uh, the balls, and uh, we check if they are overlapping. If they are, there's probably a collision, and then we do some more uh, in-depth checking, which I'm going to explain right now. Okay, uh, after we know that the two objects are, uh, have probably, are probably colliding, uh, what we have to do is calculate the new speeds for the objects so they move apart. Uh, basically, what, what this case is, it's a two-dimensional uh, elastic collision that you probably remember from your physics classes. So the idea is that uh, every object has its impulse or momentum, which is defined by uh, the mass times the velocity of that object. And when those uh, objects collide, there are formulas to calculate the new velocities of each of the uh, objects. Basically, we compare uh, two by two objects from all of them, and calculate new velocities. I won't go into details and into formulas how this is done. There's some references at the end of the presentation where you can uh, check out the formulas if you want. I'm going to just give you an overview how we do it for, for each of the cases. 
uh, if you have two circles, um, first thing you have to find is the, the normal that's uh, the line that goes uh, through the to, to the centers of the both, both circles, and we call that the line of the collision. Uh, we have to split the velocities on the velocities of each object along that normal and the velocities perpendicular to that normal. Uh, that's basically translating into a new coordinate system relative to that uh, normal. And after that, we calculate the new velocities along that normal and along the tangent and we uh, calculate them back to the global coordinates. Uh, the case for uh, the circle and the uh, the rectangle is almost the same, uh, but in this case, you uh, you are looking at the center of the, the circle and the closest point on the on the rectangle. It's basically doing the same thing. Okay, once you've done this, uh, your objects will will collide and and uh, then bounce off each other, but, but it still won't be uh, totally realistic. To to add that realistic element. Uh, you have to add something called the restitution co uh, coefficient. Basically, um, in in reality, for example, if you if you drop a ball to uh, to the ground, it will bounce, but it won't bounce back to the same heights from which you've dropped it. So we have to lose some of the some of the velocity. And basically, what we do, we just uh, multiply the calculated velocities with some coefficient, which makes it feel um, more real. And okay, this is how, how it's imagined in the game. Uh, each, each ball is represented with a circle, and uh, here's the enlarged picture of that bucket that's on the bottom, and we have two rectangles that, that aren't visible, but here they're, they've been drawn so you can see them, uh, uh, which uh, define the collision points for, for uh, the balls. So you have the feeling that they're bouncing off the edges of, of that bucket. Uh, also, I want to mention that the mass of those uh, rectangles is defined to be infinite. Uh, basically, what that does is it keeps them in place. They don't bounce off when they've collided. Uh, they're like solid walls, and only user can, can drag them uh, across the screen. And yeah, that's, that's how we achieve that uh, collision with, with the bucket. Okay. Uh, if you, if you go on and implement all this, it's going to be fine, but you'll notice uh, one, one artifact called um, sinking. Um, what happens is that due to floating point errors that accumulate over time, uh, for example, if, if an object, or a, for example, a ball falls on the ground or on the, uh, um, the border of that bucket, and over time, if it didn't bounce off, it will start to, to sink. Uh, because on each calculation, uh, you, you accumulate some error and the position of the ball starts to uh, fall down. It starts to change it to the gravity and everything. Uh, in order to compensate that, uh, you simply, uh, when you, um, when you, when you uh, handle the collision, you have to move the objects that are colliding for a small percentage of their mass along that colliding uh, normal. <laughs> and that will, that will reduce that, that effect, that artifact of, um, of sync. Okay, uh, so let's talk about uh, scoring a little bit and how we've uh, done that. Sorry. Uh, so as I've said, the idea is to collect money, as many points as you can in a limited amount of time uh, <coughs> by catching, catching those balls. And in the in order to achieve that uh, scoring, we have a rectangular region uh, between those two that I've mentioned earlier, uh, in which we check uh, if, a, if an object, a circle object, object that represents a ball is within that region, it means that it's, it's been caught inside of the bucket. So uh, we, leave, we delete that object, we uh, add the score, and yeah, the, the physics engine won't calculate uh, the collisions for it anymore. Uh, now let's give a short architectural architectural overview of of um, the engine. Uh, basically, yeah, it's really simple. You have a physics engine that does all the physics calculations on each uh, on each frame. It works with 
uh, circles and uh, rect rectangle objects and calculates gravity and, uh, and their uh, collisions. And you have a generator that uh, constantly spawns new, new uh, objects on the top of the screen. And how, how did we do that in, in Android? Uh, basically, we, we, we've extended a view. Uh, we didn't use OpenGL. You might ask uh, yourselves why. Well, we didn't need to. It was fast enough even without the OpenGL. Uh, what we did, we, we just um, forced the invalidate inside of the view inside of a loop using a handler. And that, uh, the, the result of that is that you constantly have uh, the redraws of that, of that um, view. And each time the view is redrawn on each frame, uh, first we apply the gravity to object, all objects, meaning uh, we increase their uh, uh, vertical velocity and we move them a bit down. Uh, then we check and resolve all the collisions. We generate new objects if, um, if a certain amount of time has passed since the last object was generated. And we, based on that state uh, of, of the objects, we draw a new frame. Okay, uh, so just to conclude, uh, before I, I'll uh, show you the, the example of the game, uh, what, we've, uh, what we've learned and what we've realized from all of this uh, <coughs> is that we, you don't really have to use OpenGL if you're uh, writing a game. And one thing that, that we learned the hard way is that um, various screen sizes and, and resolutions can really be a problem uh, because consider that if you're calculating your speed in uh, pixels per, per second, well, in the various resolutions you'll have uh, various number of pixels representing um, a distance. And then you might think, okay, I can use density pixels instead. And that will uh, give you the ability to okay, achieve the same speed on uh, various devices. The feeling will be the same, but uh, still you have the problem of um, different screen sizes in, in uh, I mean, in physical, physically different screen sizes, uh, it's going to be easier to play the game on a larger screen. So what what we uh, did is we we've taken account the screen size, and we've calculated the velocity relative to the to the screen height to make the game same difficulty on um, on all resolutions. Okay, um, these are the references, but. Okay, you'll check them uh, later on when the presentation is online. And now I'm just going to show you how the game looks like. Um, okay. So yeah, you can see collisions are working. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really good at this, even though I implemented it. Maybe I should have considered adding some cheats. But. Yeah. Anyways, you can do this for a minute. And yeah, then the game, the game finishes. Uh, you can see those uh, rectangles where, where the balls uh, bounce off. And yeah. I'm going to quit the game because I'm so bad. Uh, basically, that's it. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, now's the time. <coughs> yeah, well, I guess no questions. Yeah. Is the simulation tied somehow to the FPS of the device? What happens if the, some older and weaker devices FPS drops below 30? Um, <coughs> Well, yeah, actually, I must admit, I haven't tested it on all the devices. It's for Android 4.0 and larger, but probably the game would break, would break if the FPS rate drops below some, yeah, so some level. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by inside to the FPS. Well, usually some games uh, calculate their physics uh, by the difference in time between the, well, FPS, so if you... Oh, you mean, up the FPS to slow it down. Uh, yeah, down. well, it's uh, as I mentioned, it it does the redrawing by posting um, by invalidating, and yeah, it's not tied to the FPS itself. Um, it's it does check the time difference, but I think the engine implementation would start doing some pretty weird things if the FPS rate drops, because you would have yeah, anyways, it it wouldn't work on low FPS. 
Why did you put such a fire restitution factor on the walls? Oh, I mean, they, they bounce all on the screen. They bounce. Well, I checked the restitution factor for, for the plastic balls and I've added that. Yeah, so it kind of worked for the game. It, it looked fun, so I stick with that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you. Uh, how did the quantity of the ball affect your performance overall? Did you encounter, like, for instance, if you had the. Uh, Let's say 100 randomized balls spawning at the same time would crash the app or would it go slower or how would that go? Uh, it would definitely go slower. I, ha I must admit I haven't tested uh, because we didn't need that, that much. Uh, it wouldn't be playable, but it would probably slow down. Maybe even crash if, if it exceeds the memory, but I must admit I haven't tested that. But yeah. let's say, did you uh, put like a control border on much maximum? Mm, no, 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 no. Anything else? Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, for an object, do you check collision uh, for each and every other object? Or do you uh, have some sort of optimization? Uh, we, we have an optimization. You don't che check each uh, two pairs. Uh, basically, you have two for loops uh, each in another. First one goes through all the objects, and the second inner one goes through um, the current object and all the rest. So, not sure how to explain it better. Uh, you don't check every every object with every other, but with those two that you've already checked, you don't go through them again. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have one idea for the game. Are okay. you considering uh, putting the walls on? Each side of the screen, so the balls don't bounce off the screen. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it could be implemented. It'd probably so be a lot more interesting because I would more. Yeah. Go on. Yes. Uh, you said that, that there could be some problems with the different resolutions on different devices. Is uh, there a way to go around it? To just start, uh, to just use the different ratios of the screen and not really calculate for every different resolution. Uh, we're, we're not really cal calculating for, for every um, resolution. Basically what we do, uh, we calculate the speed in pixels per second depending on the height of the screen. So, I don't know. The idea is that the, if you have a larger screen, the speed will be faster, but the time from, for, for the ball to fall from the top to the bottom is always the same. That's, that's kind of our idea. Uh, anyone else? No, I think not. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Miroslav, and I'm an Android engineer at Infinum. And today I'm going to talk about uh, Android Studio plugin and uh, based on our experience on developing Garfield. Uh, so, uh, what was the problem that we were dealing with? And probably most of the Android developers are dealing with the same problem, is that there is a lot of boilerplate code out there. So, oops. okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you know, there are many examples of boilerplate in Android, and uh, take for example, sending an email or sending SMS, or marking a pin on a map, uh, you always have to write many lines of code to just do one logical operation, and that's boil boilerplate. So, uh, and there's also Dagger, which we use for dependency injection, and there's a lot of boilerplate for using Dagger also, but that's another kind of animal that I will be talking about a bit more later and I will explain what I mean. So, uh, <coughs> is this the solution? Should we just pull up the sleeves and start digging when we have boilerplate code and say, okay, don't be lazy, just start digging. It's dirty work, but somebody has to do it. Well, 
we say no. That is not the way how we think here in Fimo. Uh, we want the machine to do the dirty work and we want to be creative. So this is the solution that we are looking for. Uh, and for dealing with some smaller boilerplate code, we will start just with this kind of solution. And let's take a look at the example. Uh, so this is a simple code snippet that marks a pin on a map. And uh, this snippet, would you write all the lines by yourself? Would you code it by hand? Maybe you would. Maybe someone would. It's not that deep. But how about this? This is for sending an email. So you have to do all those boot extras. So what you usually do, what I do, I go to some project that I already did before and I just copy and paste. Do you do the same? Yeah. Well, the good news is there's a better way to do it. There are live templates <coughs> and it's built into Android Studio. It's a tool that you can use and whenever you have the need to copy paste, remember live templates. You just select that code and go to tools and save as live template and you will create your own collection of templates. And Android Studio will, it will give it a name and when you start typing that name, it will automatically paste the code that is saved in that template. So, and you also have the possibility to export your template. So it's a nice and neat way to reuse the code that you were previously copy pasting. Uh, and the good news is there are some uh, already built-in templates uh, besides <laughs> the ones that you will be creating. So let's take a look at one such built-in template. Uh, this template defines a secret code where you define an intent and you define an action. It's a view action. And uh, you will see that it does not... Does it have a pointer? You will see that it does not have uh, defined the URI. So uh, this part is marked as variable part and uh, it will be asked, the standard studio will ask you to fill in this part once it pastes the rest of the code. So besides just, just using static code, you can customize and uh, mark the variable parts. That's also neat. And there's one more thing uh, besides variables that can be used in live templates. You can also apply some modification scripts to those variable parts. So you can, for example, say, uh, I want this name when I type, I want it to uh, be transformed to upper cases. And you can do many more stuff. You can use actually uh, Groovy scripts and uh, it gives you even more possibility to transform what you're typing as variable parts of the snippets. So uh, it's quite powerful tool and simple. You can create uh, live templates <coughs> just like that. And uh, there are also some limitations that we must mention. Uh, so they can generate code uh, inside a file that is open, but it cannot generate new classes, new packages, new files, and it cannot uh, check if there are any uh, members in the class. So that is the limitation that we were facing and that is why we needed something more powerful. And uh, uh, we actually are generating several classes and it's related to our use of uh, MVP and Dagger for dependency injection and that is actually some good practice to develop our code and uh, now I will try just to explain a bit how many classes do we generate. That is why we are developing Garfield. Uh, so uh, for using MVP we need to generate uh, one interface for model that is also called interceptor, one for view and one interface for presenter. So that's three classes. Then we need to generate uh, implementations for each of these interfaces. So one implementation goes for uh, interceptor, 
uh, for interactor, sorry, uh, one for view and one for presenter. Okay, that's six files that we need to generate and two more for dagger that uh, is used for dependency injection. We need to generate class, we need to generate class uh, component and module. So that's eight classes and each of these classes has some code in it. So that's, it takes us about, in ideal case, 30 seconds, it, I think that's, I think, mm, the least time that we need to spend on, on one class. So multiplied by four, it's let's say five minutes for uh, one MVP. Okay, so uh, well, this is the process of developing plugin and it's a bit more uh, complicated uh, than just creating uh, live templates. Uh, you actually need to write code and that code will then generate the code for you. Uh, so you need to uh, you need to get the uh, IntelliJ IDEA uh, development environment and you will write your plugin in that uh, environment and when you build uh, your plugin it will uh, generate new instance of Android Studio and uh, it will put your plugin into that instance. You can test it and after that if you're satisfied you can export it and share with other developers. Uh, so the setup uh, needs to, uh, uh, in, in the setup you need to uh, clone IntelliJ Community Edition. Uh, then you need to run one script that will get you an, an instance of uh, Android Studio. And after that you will create a Java SDK that needs to have this name and watch uh, for the uh, uppercase, lowercase, it's case sensitive. Then you will make a project and create a new IntelliJ platform plugin. So uh, let's get down to the code. Uh, the entry point for your plugin is uh, an action that is taken from the menu when, you're, when the user uses your plugin. So you probably use many plugins, like for example, uh, drawable import, you select a uh, new file and then go to uh, global import and then select the action which you want to do. So it's an action that you need to define and you define an action by creating a new class and uh, extending an action class. And once you define a new uh, action class, uh, it will prompt you, uh, actually it will complain that uh, this action is not registered so you can register it just by uh, pressing Alt Enter, and uh, you will get this kind of form that will you will fill in all the details, and the details will be saved in the plugin XML. Uh, and after you created an action, uh, you will uh, want to uh, take some user input from uh, for for reacting to uh, some input that you want the user to do. And for the UI, you will use a Swing UI. Uh, and most probably, you will use a dialog to get the user input. Uh, and uh, for getting the user input, you will create uh, a form. Uh, it's, uh, it has a binded code behind that UI form and uh, you will need to extend dialog wrapper class uh, in that code behind the UI and you will have to override this crucial uh, method and return the root panel, it's, the, it's actually the parent, the top parent of uh, all the widgets that are used in the form. So that's what you need to return. And after creating your UI that takes some parameters. Uh, for generation of the, the code, uh, you will need to uh, get the name of the package into which you want to generate classes. And that for you will use Android Facet. So IntelliJ actually has uh, several uh, facets and Facet is actually uh, the thing by which IntelliJ different, uh, differentiates between 
what kind of uh, framework or language are you using with Android? Are you developing Google App Toolkit, Enterprise Java Beans? So we'll use Android Facet. Uh, and then it will know that there is Android manifest, that there are resources and stuff, and it will know how to handle that. And you need to get the package name uh, in this kind of way or similar. Uh, we use this way to get it from Android manifest. And after you get uh, uh, the package, uh, then you <coughs> actually go to generating the code. And uh, we found that uh, uh, Java Poet is quite elegant way of uh, creating new code. Uh, so here, uh, gray uh, layers are the simple hello world class uh, that has one static method main and prints out a string. And with this, this yellow text is Java Poet and how it generates this class. So. Uh, the first line you see that you're using your method builder and uh, then you are adding public static modifiers you define what it should return what kind of class add parameters add statement and it's quite elegant it's not complicated uh, and then when you created your method then you the same way you create your class with class builder and you give it uh, the, the method that you created before so, is that sounds good? Is it complicated? No. So, uh, just a few more um, words for the end. Uh, be smart, be lazy. And uh, uh, I hope you uh, learn that you can use live templates if you do copy-pasting. And it's a better way to reuse your code. Uh, it will make you more productive, but it also has some limitations, and uh, uh, if you face that limitations, then you should probably uh, apply uh, and try to build Android Studio plugin. <coughs> so there are some references in the end. I will be glad to hear your questions. <laughs> so you're developing the Garfield plugin. Uh, so how many functionalities does it have currently? So mm -hmm. what uh, can you build what you cannot build, and what is the future set for the future? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll just repeat for the uh, for the recording stuff. Uh, so the question was, uh, how many features does the Garfield plugin have, and what features are we planning to uh, provide in the future? Uh, yes, well, uh, currently uh, we have a generation, generating of uh, MVP, so we create an interface for MVP and we create implementations for MVP interfaces. And then we create a dagger injection, uh, we create a component, and we create a model uh, for, for dagger 2. And uh, uh, in the dagger uh, model, we create all those provide methods uh, that uh, provide us uh, uh, interactor, they provide us a view, and they provide us uh, the presenter. And we register that in the component. And uh, we inject that into fragment or activity. So that's, that's basically the functionalities that are currently supported. Uh, uh, soon we will have the plugin uh, available and uh, we also uh, want to develop more functionalities uh, not only related to MVP and Dagger but uh, some other uh, boilerplate code that we uh, usually use some JSON generation generating some serialization for uh, stuff like that in There are many other ideas in the team. Yep. Is it open source project or is it company closed project? Well, it's still not uh, public, I think. For now, it's for now. Uh, but we'll probably open it. We'll think we about it. We haven't actually discussed it. We discussed it when the first release goes live. Yep. Yep. 
uh, was there another question? I think I saw a hand there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Damian and I'm Android engineer at Infinum. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we deal with freshes and our fresh handling for our apps. So, uh, we have three main topics. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you something about Timber, which is library for logging. Then I will tell you something about prosthetics <coughs> and how we combine those two, Timber and prosthetics. We have a uh, very nice uh, cash handling. And then, uh, last thing, I'm going to show you uh, one crash handler. I'm going to explain what is it and what it does. So, uh, what we want, uh, what do we want with our uh, crash handling? When our app is in development, uh, we, we want all our plotting and all uh, uh, crashes, all stack traces that happen, we uh, want all of them to be printed in WorkCat in our Android Studio. Uh, but on the other side, when our app is in production, uh, we don't need any logging. It's useful, unuseful, and uh, it's potentially harmful because it can uh, contain some private data. So uh, we just don't want any logging uh, to be happening in production. But uh, what we want is all our uh, crashes or maybe some messages uh, to be collected somewhere. And for, for that, uh, we use prosthetics. Uh, okay, uh, what is Timber? Timber is a library made by, by Jake Wharton. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, a little bit better uh, than normal uh, work Android work class because it provides some uh, utility uh, on top of it, and it provides it's you can configure it in many ways. Uh, it has logging methods just as normal uh, uh, timber, uh, just as normal log class, and um, it by default it doesn't uh, it doesn't do any any logging, uh, if you don't configure it, it won't, if you call, for example, one method, uh, let's say debug method, uh, nothing will uh, happen. Why is that? Uh, that's because we need to call in our apps on create, we need to call uh, plant method and provide it with some tree. Uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, debug tree, it's, it's one of Timber's default uh, trees. Uh, and what it does, it simply prints everything to locket. So if you do this first line, and then whenever you call some Timber method, what will happen is it will work just like normal uh, log class. But also, uh, we can uh, provide our implementation of this timber tree, and I'll show later why it's useful. Okay, uh, next thing is prosthetics. Probably most of you uh, know what is prosthetics. It's just a uh, re reporting tool. Uh, so, when you're at, at precious, uh, what will happen? Uh, stack trace alongside with some other data will be sent to server, and you can uh, go to the to Prestitix website and see what's going on with your app. You can see uh, here's uh, 
how it looks like. You can see on the top there is uh, some basic information about um, uh, device model, Android version, and so on. And then you will have um, stack trace or some your messages. You, you can also uh, provide uh, your message, send some message to the person. But all crashes will be will be well there. So when our app is in production, uh, this is what we want. We want all uh, messages, all the uh, crashes to be reported uh, in the crashlytics. But it's it's not useful for us when it, when we are developing uh, because because we can see in uh, what cat what is going on. Uh, how to how to do it? How to uh, have two different behaviors? So first thing you need is uh, to define Timber's crash reporting tree uh, for production phase. Uh, in this uh, example, we uh, what we do is we ignore all the uh, Timber logins, uh, which are which has prior low priorities uh, that are verbose and debug in this example. So whenever someone logs debug some debug message, it will it will be uh, nothing will nothing will happen. But um, all the others will be logged to Crystalytics, and also if it's exception, it will be a whole stack trace will be sent. Uh, next, next thing we want to do is in our apps on create to initialize Crystalytics and uh, set it disabled when it's uh, when when we are in debug mode. We know that from our build config. Uh, and after that, what we do is um, we ask if we are in debug mode. In that case, we plant uh, debug tree. I explained you earlier, uh, and it will just log everything to Rocket. But if we are in production, then we uh, plant our crash reporting tree, which I just explained. And how it works? Well, let's say you have some try catch block, and you do. Uh, I don't know, let's say we deal with uh, server responses and it can contain some unexpected data and you get uh, exception. Okay, you will catch exception and do whatever you want to it, but uh, maybe we want to know that this is happening and we want to put it uh, either to Rocket if we are developing it. Or we want to send, we want it to be sent uh, on Crystalytics server. So we call Timber E uh, method. It's for exception. We we pass exception and some message, and then what will happen? It will end up here. So if we are in debug mode, it will just print everything to Rocket. But uh, otherwise, it will uh, go to this this crash reporting tree and be sent to Crystalytics. So in this way we have uh, we covered that both situation in development and production phase. Okay, next thing uh, I'm going to talk about is app crash handler. Uh, well, it's uh, with this handler uh, what we do is we intercept the moment before your app crashes. So we know uh, that next thing what's going to happen is your app is about to crash and then we can uh, use this to to do something different than normal behavior. For example, we want we may want to restart app or we, we may want to restart some uh, specific activity or whatever. Uh, this app crash handler we, we saw uh, by by guys in Square, they they are using it and they they gave uh, one 
next presentation uh, about it, uh, and it will be available in the links, so you can check it out. Uh, what, what, what was the difference when we use this at crash handler? So uh, this is some simple dummy app, which has one button, and this button uh, crashes your app throws runtime exception only. And on the left side, uh, we have uh, normal behavior. So your app is closed, and you get this other system dialog that uh, your app is crashed. But on the right side, we are using uh, this crash handler. And in, that, in this particular case, uh, we, we intercept the moment when it's about to crash. And we say, OK, let's restart the main activity. It, the same activity, but we pass through intent uh, one boolean saying, okay, I can come from fresh. Uh, and then in our, on creates of that activity, we uh, say if we are coming from fresh, we just display this dialog, that some custom dialog. We, we could just uh, restart activity or some other activity, whatever. And here is how to do it. You have to implement your own uh, thread unconfirmed exception handler. Basically, this is a little bit simplified uh, um, version, not simplified, but just the core main things that you need. You have to keep uh, a reference to live activity, and then here you end up here when your app is about to crash. And what we do is uh, just uh, put uh, many activities in time and finish this one and start new activity. So this particular case will just restart your main activity. You can, yeah, you, you can do whatever you want here. And to to get this working, you just need uh, in your apps on create to uh, set this default unquote exception handler to be your uh, app crash handler and then uh, it will work. Uh, yeah, and I have to mention that uh, all the stuff uh, I told you before about crash tips and Timber will work uh, alongside this with any, without any more configuration. Uh, when your app crashes, you will still get uh, notification in crash uh, tips. And um, yeah, thank you. That's it for me. Do you have questions? Yes. I want to just uh, slide before this one. If you had system x is zero, what does it do? Uh, nothing. It just uh, closes. Uh, it three or yeah. uh, I believe that. Any more questions? So yeah. does your crash handler just say that? If you do uh, the next action, you will crash your app, and that's it. You don't really crash it. You just say that it will crash if you do. No, your your app is about to crash. You return your slides back. This okay. So when you press it. No, okay. So when I press this button, uh, I throw a new runtime exception, and. This will happen in a, yeah. in a normal way, but uh, uh, in this case, you end up here, and I I set uh, my main activity as the next activity, and I also uh, put one boolean uh, for my main activity, saying uh, you are starting main activity uh, from the crash. So I just one boolean, and then I have in my uh, main activity on create. I I ask if if it's true if I start it from fresh. Then I will pop up uh, the dialog saying something bad happened or whatever. Uh, you could I could uh, say um, I don't know maybe something disturb. I I could just uh, restart that without anything without without not any users. Uh, yeah, that's. That's basically what Twitter does in their app. They just restart that and 
if you are completely unaware of that uh, question. More questions? Okay, uh, here are uh, references. You can see, okay, it's for Timber uh, Library. The <coughs> presentation, that's uh, first presentation, really nice, check it out. And uh, there is one uh, library that our colleague Jericho is building. Uh, it basically does all the stuff. I just mentioned for you. Uh, it's still, he's still developing it, so it's not final version, but yeah, you can check it out, it's public. 